Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. I'm Serena, I'm one of the GP mummies that's gonna be delivering the webinar for you today. Um, what would be great, while we wait for everybody to get on, because we've had hundreds and hundreds of people sign up for this, which is amazing, if you come and just pop your name in the chat box, if you're shy, you can send it as a private message, but if you can just say, you know, your name and where you're dialing in from, um, then that's great. It gives us an idea of where everybody's tuning in from. And I'm joined by, they're hiding at the moment. So Rachel and Jenny, Hello. would you like to come on? I'm... Are you still there? I'm still here, I'm Serena. My, my, um, of my <laughs> I'm on. Be, my my um, um, video is on, so can you see us? Give everyone a few... Minutes. Hi, Peace. Oh, that's a lovely name from Sutton Coldfield. Great. Hi, Va Van. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, Becca. Hi, Becca. Okay. Hi, Sarah from Sheffield. Iram. Hi. Yo, that's uh, that's my neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. Serena, can you hi, sing us in Honduras? Can hi, you see me, Serena? Emily, Holly, Holly's from Cambridge. Oh, you're there, Rachel. Hi. Really Is Jenny there? Jenny's there. Jenny, maybe just dial out and in again. Did it kick you out the webinar? There we are. Oh, hi, everybody. Can you see me, Serena? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I couldn't before, so I sent you a WhatsApp saying... Ah, oh. no, I was, I could see myself, but I, I thought you can, can you see me as well? Yeah, I can. And Jenny, I can see you as well. So we've got right. Maria. So I've just asked everybody to tell me their name. Paula. Brilliant. Hi everyone. Gosh, um, all over the place. Okay. So VM saying they can see and hear me. Can everyone hear Rachel and Jenny as well? <laughs> they could see all three of us, but you couldn't see us for some oh, weird no, reason. I couldn't, I couldn't, but I can now. <laughs> it's all right. I think, we're, I think we're all on. It's all okay. Oh, Rama, you're coming in from Ireland. Wow. Hello. Welcome. Nida from Luton. Oh, I was doing the VTS talk at Luton a few weeks ago. Selma oh, from hi, Adrian. Hotford. Adrian from Isle of Man. So, shall we, while we give everyone a few minutes to log on, shall I do the poll, Rachel and uh, Jenny? Go for it. Go for it with the poll. Let's do so, guys. What will be really handy is I'm going to publish a poll now that should be coming up on your screens. And um, oh wow, you got you ladies are on it tonight. Look, they're already <laughs> already posting their responses. I can't. Um, oh, that's really interesting. It's really, really? good, really good mix. Oh, we've got a few, a few vintage GPs. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, mostly looks like mostly ST threes and first fives, and then some ST ones and two. So we'll try and make it relevant for. For all of you, we've got lots of resources we're going to share, and um, and uh, yeah, useful tips and tricks as well. Okay, great. So let's have a look at that. So that is our audience today. Brilliant. So yeah, it looks like uh, quite a lot of new GPs ready to start is going to be our main our main thing. So Rosie from London, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer, Lucian VTS. I was there last year and the year before. Mm -hmm. Um, Rama, hi Rama. We've got Beth from York, Pfizer, Preston. Hello, Preston. welcome. Great. Right, guys, should we should we start and um, I think people will a... log on as as yeah yeah I'll join, won't they? There they go. Right. So, welcome to the webinar, everybody. So, the whole point of this webinar is to help all of us that are juggling kind of motherhood or parenthood with um, our careers, especially those transitioning from training to kind of working in general practice, like how to kind of meet the demands of that balance and, um, you know, tips and tricks to kind of thrive as opposed to just survive that whole journey. Um, so these are the topics. So Rachel, do you want to just go through roughly what we're going to all be talking about today? Yeah, so we sort of got together, didn't we, and brainstormed things that we wish we'd we'd known when we uh, yeah. when we qualified. So we're going to start off by talking about how do I find work that suits me? Because and um, the great thing about general practice is it's very varied, and no one, no two practices are alike. So how can you find the right practice? How do you find the right sort of work? 
we're going to talk about how do we structure our weeks to get good work-life balance, which I everyone knows is, is really important. Um, then Jenny's going to talk us through some really important stuff around finances. You know, what are you, what are you entitled to? And I think a lot of us are pretty ignorant about that. I know I, I certainly was. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about actually when we come back from parental leave, how do we hit the ground running? Because believe me, it's things are very, very different coming back after maternity leave as just from the, the as opposed to just coming back from a, a holiday or an extended holiday or a sabbatical. And then we're going to finish talking about how do we keep on thriving at work? Because, you know, we need to, we need to live, we need to have, in, enjoy our lives and not just feel like work is a complete slog and, and find joy in what we do. So that's what we're going to, going to cover. Yeah. And then um, just, there's a chat box there. So pop any questions that you've got, because we want this to be really interactive and we want you to leave the webinar feeling like any of your questions have been answered and you've got a bit of clarity going forward. Jenny and I present for a lot of um, VTSs up and down the country, actually, and she's very experienced with helping GPs deal with that transition into, you know, from trainee to either a self-employed GP or portfolio GP and managing your accounts and tips and tricks on that. And so she's going to be sharing her experience as well. OK, great. So thanks, Jenny. We're going to get you back in a few moments once we've delivered the first part. Um, OK, so a bit about me. So I am kind of just kind of at, coming towards the end of my first five, actually. Um, I qualified from the St Mary's scheme just about five years ago now. And as an ST3, I had my daughter and um, I had a year out then on maternity leave. And during that year, I did a lot of baby yoga and soft play with her. But I also um, had the opportunity to get off that hamster wheel of like AKT, CSA, exams, rotations. And I found that actually I was interested in a lot of things. Um, I found the idea of leaving her to then go back to finish my training and work actually very daunting. And it caused me a lot of anxiety and stress and a lot of guilt. And I kind of decided, look, I, I don't really like seeing patients all the time. I think I'm good at a lot of other things. And I really want to work flexibly because I want to be around a bit more. And um, I then kind of decided when I finished, I was going to create what now is called a portfolio career. And the reasons for it really was around my children. Um, we're going to talk about guilt um, kind of in the next bit. But um, I think, that, you know, kind of feeling a bit guilty and kind of wanting to really create a life that I didn't feel guilty about and could be happy about meant that I now have this career and this is really my CV. So I'm co-founder of a software which supports um, locum GPs, portfolio GPs, salary GPs who do locum or other types of work called My Locum Manager. And um, that takes up a lot of, you know, most of my time and I love, I love it. And as part of that, I deliver regular webinars every month for our members. Um, I'm also a presenter for Redwell GP Update, which I really, again, enjoy the educational element of it. Um, you can see my kids uh, there in between. I write for Pulse. I work with my local CCG. I'm a Millen GP as well. And when I finished training, I initially for the first few years taught um, as a tutor for King's College and Imperial College. Um, I actually started that as a, as a GP trainee, um, as an ST2, and it was paid work and I really enjoyed it. So I very much can say I really enjoy my life. It does still revolve around my children, but I have a very fulfilled career now. And um, I'm kind of excited to share some tips and hopefully get you guys, you know, pumped up for kind of the next phase of your careers kind of with with children and, and with the challenges that can sometimes present. OK, Rachel, over to you. OK, so th th this is me. I, Serena, you're making me feel really old because I actually graduated in 1998 from Nottingham. So like pre-millennium. Can't believe it. <laughs> um, and um I did went straight into GP training, really, because I couldn't really think, figure out what else to do. Um, but what I was really lucky in my GP training is they had a six month extension in those days where they would fund you to, to um, learn a specialist subject. I went and did medical education for six months at the end of my GP training, which meant that when I qualified, I worked as a, a salary doctor portfolio GP so that I could go off and do educational stuff. And I started with the refugee doctors program at Barts in the London. Um, and I also worked with Cambridge University where I was for a very long time as assistant director of studies. And then I set up and led the doctor as a professional curriculum. And as part of that, I got a special interest in sort of resilience, teamwork, leadership. And I decided to train as an executive coach, having had my own sort of career 
wanting to do a bit of a career change, got some coaching and myself and then um, really have gone into well-being coaching leadership development space. So I'm also a lead uh, Red Whale presenter. I present the Lead Manage Thrive course and I'm now director of leadership courses for Red Whale um, as well as working as an executive coach and I've set up my own business now doing really resilience training for doctors and other professionals in high stress jobs and I host a podcast called You Are Not a Frog which I absolutely love um, and I I have three I have three children now I I qualified before I had my kids so I, I finished my GP training before I had my kids and I worked for about three years as a salaried GP before I had my kids um, it was really tough. My husband was wearing an awful lot where the, where the kids were young. Now I've now got sort of teenagers. I've now got a 15 year old, a 13 year old and a 10 year old. And it's interesting that the challenges change. You know, I when they're really little, you're absolutely knackered and it takes a lot of time and attention. But what I found that as teenagers, they require just as much time and attention, but in a, but in a different way. So, you know, that the challenges of being a mum and working never really go away. They they change and they become different. Um, and for me, I like that, that top that top picture. That I like getting out on my bike, particularly during lockdown, and actually getting away from the children and the family. Um, and that's me after um, a very long bike ride. But it's nice because my, my son can now come with me. So so that's good. So is there anything else I need to tell you about me? No, that's it, I think. There we go. Great. And then we've got Jenny. I'm back. You're back. Thanks, Jenny. I thought you were saving me for later, but I'm back. No, I want you to, yeah, I want you to introduce yourself. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm Jenny Hurst. I'm um, a healthcare partner at BHP Chartered Accountants. Um, I, I think uh, Rachel's just commented that uh, Serena makes you feel old. I think you both make me feel old. I, I qualified as a chartered accountant in 1996, so my degree was quite a way before then, um, after before I'd done my profession. Nice to represent, though. It's nice to represent the different different age groups. Yes. So I'm, I probably re represent the vintage end. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually got um, three children, uh, two two of my own and one is a, a stepdaughter. So one is now 20 um, and the other are both 16. So so when I had mine uh, many years ago, um, I, I actually went back um, full time after after um, after my maternity leave. And we only had six months maternity leave in those days. No, no 12 months, you know. <laughs> I think I was doing my pajamas six months into yeah, yeah. maternity leave <laughs> with like baby sick down me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I probably had baby sick down me as well, in fairness, but um, <laughs> but, but at work anyway. So it was back back full time, but it probably lasted about two months, um, and then I quickly dropped down to four days. And really, I've stayed on four on I stayed on four days for quite a, a long period of time. At the time, I was employed by uh, by BHP. They were very flexible with me, so I did my four days. And when my uh, eldest child went to school, I then did the equivalent of four days over a period of five days, so I could be at the school gates um, sometimes. So that worked quite well for me. Um, so yeah, now my minor teenagers, I think um, I'm probably um, edging towards the time where one of them might be flying the nest. And I, uh, I echo your comments, Rachel, about um, the challenges of of being a mom changing. I think when they're young, it's sort of physically tiring. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as they get older, it's so it's sort of more mentally wearing because you worry about them, and you, and you have less control about what they do. So you hope that what you've taught them and and what they've learned, they they sort of use that. But um, but you at twenty year old, you don't have a lot of control over over them. So yeah, it it, it can be a worry sometimes. But um, but yeah, love them all. <laughs> don't regret any of it. So in terms of me, uh, I'm now a partner at BHP. I've been a partner for a while now. Um, I started out in audit. I won't bore you too much about my job because it's not doesn't sound anything like as exciting as um, the varied careers of Serena and, and Rachel. Um, but I started out in audit. I started to specialise in healthcare um, about eight years ago now. So I fully work in healthcare now. And um, we have quite a big healthcare team at BHP, 30 people working just full time on, on our healthcare clients. We look after about 95 GP practices. 
um, about 350 locum doctors, also hospital consultants, GP federations. So I live and breathe um, GPs uh, every day of my working life, really. And you also, we deliver a lot of the VTS talk together, Jenny. So I think there's not a question that these guys can ask you that you won't be able to answer and help with, I think. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah we, sure. uh, probably about 20 a year we deliver at the moment. So. Yeah, yeah. You can always Google it, Jenny. They won't be able to tell. Google the answer. Right, so let's crack on then. Um, so I shall and... do it now then, shall I? I'll leave yeah, you. yeah, I'll call you oh. back in shortly. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. So guilt. So I just want to get this out the way because I've seen loads of Facebook posts and messages and I've been emailed lots of things. Actually, it was an email from a trainee that started this whole thing for doing this webinar because I've had so many from the VTS talks from GP moms or those that are pregnant just really worrying about that making that transition. And I thought, OK, I'm going to do a webinar on it. So from the guilt perspective, I think both Rachel and I want to say that you're going to feel guilty no matter what you do. If you go to work, you don't go to work, you cut back, whatever you do, you will feel guilty. But I think what's important, like what my learning lesson was, so I did the London Dean Mentoring Scheme as an ST3 and kind of finishing up as I was going back after maternity leave. And I felt hugely guilty when I first, um, my daughter wasn't at nursery, she just, my, my parents were looking after her. And um, so I was going back to finish my training and I still feel very guilty about being at work and when I went for a coaching session I talked about this with the coach and I said oh um yeah I'm feeling really guilty because I'm going to finish now and I'm going to have to find like probably do six to eight sessions and I'm going to do this and I've got to look for a nursery because my parents can't help out all the time and then she just asked me um she said well if you go if you go against the guilt what's going to happen I said well if I just think I feel guilty but I've got to get on with it I what's going to happen is I'm going to do about eight eight sessions maybe nine sessions as a GP probably as a locum and you know I need to just get financially stable again and, and that's what I'm going to do and she said what if you notice the guilt and you give in to the guilt what's going to happen then I said well I'd probably have to find more flexible ways of working um, I know I'm not happy seeing patients for eight to ten sessions a week so I'd probably want to find some other stuff that brings home money but that I really enjoy doing and I'd really kind of make sure I had some balance. And she was like, well, why don't you do that? And I said, well, because I don't know how. And then she was like, well, why don't you learn? And I was like, yeah, it's a really good point. <laughs> so, that's what, so that's what I did. I, I listened to the guilt and I cut back and I thought, right, I need to love what I'm doing. If I'm leaving this little thing and then two little things to go and do something, I've got to at least justify it with loving what I do. And, and I, you know, that's essentially what's happened with me. And I think, Rachel, you've got something to say on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think guilt just goes with being a mum. Like you said, you feel guilty if you go to work. You feel guilty if you don't go to work. I Someone once said to me something really helpful that you can give your toddler 110% of your time and it still won't be enough. <laughs> You know, yeah, kids so just demand attention and energy from you. And no matter how much you give them, they always want more. And so there's this concept of being good enough. You know, you're a yeah. good enough parent. And I think we need to we need to hold on to that. You know, if your kid is loved and they're fed and if they have consistent caregiving and you know that is good enough. And you need to listen, you need to listen to yourself. You know, what is your guilt yeah. telling you? Is it telling you that you need to spend more time at home or is it telling you that you you just want to get out and you just want to go to work because yeah. it, it keeps you sane and that's totally fine as there well. There is no there yeah. is no right or wrong way but I think the other thing about guilt is often it's at, it's it's ourselves putting unrealistic expectations on ourselves it's not actually yeah. for other people often we say oh he's he's making me feel guilty or she's making me feel guilty or that actually it's it's ourselves and it's our unrealistic expectations of yeah, ourselves. Right, yeah definitely so yeah give yourself a break and just really think about what you want and look at what the guilt may be telling you. There's no, you don't have to work eight to 10 sessions. You don't, you don't actually have to do anything you don't want to do like post CCT or during CCT. You, it's just that you might not know how not to do the norm and to do what you want to do, but there's loads of support out there. And we're going to share lots of different resources that you can access, but we just wanted to get this out of the way to kind of, because we, we, we all get it. We all feel it. We still, you know, I still feel it now, but um, you know, it's kind of important. So I'm going to publish a poll about the key things you'd like advice on kind of for the content of the webinar. But one thing that a lot of people were messaging about was how do I find work that suits me? And this isn't necessarily that you want to do 10 sessions 
or anything like that. But part of the work you find and the number of sessions you do will determine the amount of juggling that you have to do and the amount of um, logistics you're going to have to kind of work through to just get through your working day or your working week. And Rachel's going to share some really good tips on how to do that. So the first step in terms of applying for work or getting access to those different roles that I talked about is you need this checklist in place. So especially if you're an ST3 and you're about to finish or maybe you finish or you come back from maternity leave. For an up-to-date CV, you can just download on the resources section of My Local Manager for free a template and you can just, it will literally take you five minutes, you just input your details and you've got a ready-made CV and I'll share that at the end, it's totally free, you can just access it and download it, but you're going to have to get these documents together. I had them saved as a PDF and every other portfolio role that I shared with you, I was probably one of the first people to interview because I, I literally had this saved, I zip, just pinged it across in an email had a copy of my references in there, everything. And I was literally first to interview before everyone else was faffling, trying to find out where all this stuff was. So definitely get this stuff together and have it ready. Now, in terms of sourcing work, I've done lots of different webinars about you know accessing different types of work. But what I'd say is currently the climate for salaried work, locum, partner work, is definitely, because of COVID, recruitment is slightly dampened down. Now, what that means is where you might have looked on online adverts or the BMJ or gone to an agency to source work, now the, the most luck you're gonna have is by going directly to practices because actually you get in there first and you'll get there before they're posting out to or advertising out to anybody else. You'll get rid of the competition because you're going to your local practices that are on your doorstep and you're making a more proactive approach than a reactive approach. And when you contact practices, make sure you say a bit about you. So I'd say, you know, I'm Serena. I live in, you know, here and, I, you know, I live local to your practice and I usually work at Dr. So-and-so's practice and name drop because all partners know all other practices and who works there and start building that connection. Um, if you're looking for a retainer role, do mention to practices that you're looking for that role, but also contact Health Education England. And if you Google GP retainer support schemes, lots of content and support comes up to help you kind of access that. So for those of you that might not know, the retainer role is essentially where you do maybe four to six sessions. It's a bit like being a salary GP, but with a bit more support. You can't locum with it, but you can do some out of hours with it. But it's a nice gap in between for, between salaried and locum. I'd say for salaried and locum roles, NHS Choices is a brilliant website. I used it to find work near my daughter's nursery, for example. Um, and if you do work directly for practices of locum, there's a T's and C's template you can download on MLM to to get you started. Rachel, is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I just we've got a we've got a question here. Of what's the retainer right, yeah. role? Could you just tell us a little bit more about what the retainer scheme is? Yeah, so the retainer scheme was, I think, launched by Health Education and NHS England as a way to recruit and retain more GPs. It sounds like it's something really painful, doesn't it? Retainer. It just doesn't sound like <laughs> doesn't sound like a barrel of laughs. But mm -hmm. essentially, if you are a mum and you want somewhere a bit constant with added support, or you've been a trainee in difficulty who's had multiple attempts at your AKT CSA, or you've had a lot of time out. So say, you know, you might be tuning into this webinar and you've had a lot of time out um, as a mum and now you're coming back into general practice, then that's a really good way of getting back into general practice. But you get built in CPD and support. You get like a dedicated, almost educational supervisor to support you with that role. And we're going to send a follow up email to everybody. And I'll put a link for the retainer scheme in there so you can you can source um, more information about it. Great. Okay, great. Um, so I just want to say for those of you that might want to locum, so you might be a salary GP and you might want to do a bit of locuming in your local area, or you might want to be a full-time locum, or you might want to be a portfolio GP like me. So all my roles are self-employed. I have to invoice for pretty much almost all of them. And, um, and I created my locum manager to basically be a seamless way of managing all that, all the what goes in my diary, then links to my phone. Um, the, the white boxes here are local practices that have linked me on here and uh, sending me additional sessions and I can put all my portfolio stuff on there and all my invoices tax expenses is all taken care of so that's a great godsend as a mum of two to get through my working week with ease but the other thing I'm really passionate about is support so as part of my local manager all our GPs get access to live monthly webinars and you'll see Jenny Rachel on you know delivering lots of different things um, we're partnered with Headspace, so we give discounts to all our GPs, and we're partnered with Red Whale as well. 
and um, you get lots of support, access to medical accountants and things like that. So if you're thinking of locuming, you might want to check it out because um, it, it might help support you in that journey. Right, over to you, Rachel. Okay, so this bit is about how we structure our working week. So I think this is really important that we, we look at this to start off with because it's really easy to qualify and go, right, what work, what work can I get? And one thing I found with GPs is that whenever someone asks you to do something, our first reaction is, yep, okay, okay, can, let me see if I'm free. If I'm free, yes, I'll book it in. Um, and I guess part of that is we don't want to say no. Part of it's quite flattering to be asked. Like if you're good, people will always ask you to do stuff. You don't want to let people down. And part of it's, you know, will I, when I get anywhere, if I say no, will they ask me again? But the problem is unless you take control of your diary, no one else will. And you can quite easily end up with this diary that's absolutely horrendous and just 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 looks looks awful. So can we go on to the next the next slide? Yeah. There are a few things I want to principles I want to talk about. And the first one is taking control over what you can control. Now, we've already talked about guilt and guilt is this sort of toxic feeling that we can have that that doesn't really doesn't really move us into action. So if you think about your, your life as a sort of blank slate um, or, or a blank white slide and what you can control is a circle in the middle. This is what I call the zone of power. Can I have the next slide, Serena? Yeah. And the zone of power is to do with everything that's under your control. So what's not in your control? Well, what's not in your control is how much work is there out there? Um, what's happening with coronavirus? How much the government is funding the NHS? What is in your control is how much I choose to work, where I choose to work, by and large, um, what time I leave the house in the morning, you know, what food I buy for my children. I'm maybe not in control over what my children actually eat of it. But if you stay in your zone of power and you you just focus on the things you can control, you'll be much more powerful and productive. If you focus on all the things you can't control, then you'll become a lot more stressed. So can we go to the next slide, Serena, so I can just work down the list? Yeah. Um, the the next button can you see the next buttons at the bottom rachel oh i've got some next one ah brilliant yeah. i can do it myself okay i'm going to go back actually to this this one here so taking control of what you can control is really important particularly when you start off on your career it's mm -hmm. up to you to decide what you want to do now the main when I coach GPs the main problem I see is that they are completely unrealistic about how long things take so a session of GP work, I think, takes longer than four hours. I think it's a bit like, you know, if you fill up a balloon with water and then you try and squeeze it into a container that's too that's too small, the balloon will just pop out. You can't you can't squidge it down. Now, if you're seeing patients, you've got administration, you're going to have to make that container a little bit bigger and make sure you have enough time for administration so this might mean that if you book if you're working six sessions a week you're actually going to have to book off seven sessions to allow you to get everything done that you need to get done because there is nothing more stressful than trying to shove that water balloon down into a small container and I can certainly remember having very very tight deadlines on having to pick up my children from childcare just the nursery was about to mm. shut and having 10 phone calls to do and and, and and an extra visit and just not knowing how and, and that for me was one of the the, the most stressful things about, about having small children and, and being a GP. So I think you need to really plan how you structure your week. And so I'm going to give you a tool that you can download and we'll send out the link to this at the end of the webinar. And that's called the Thrive Week Planner. And basically it, it's, there's some instructions on how to do it. But I want, what I want you to do is all download this and actually plot out when you want to work. OK, fill it in. And what you might want to do is actually work out how much you're working at the moment for those of you that are already working and then work out how many sessions I want, do I want to do and be absolutely realistic about how much time those sessions are going to take. Include all the admin time, include the time for your CPD and for general life admin, because if you are working as a, a locum and even just working as a salary GP, there is enough administration to do. Yeah. Um, you know to keep up with and my local manager produced some absolutely brilliant resources to, to keep up with that but you need to access yeah. them you need to you need to do it you need to do it regularly and then you need to also put in that those things that you need to do to look after yourself mm. like exercise like going to the hairdresser like taking holidays or just taking some time off and the amount of GP mums I have coached that actually the main outcome is for them is just to putting some child free work free time yeah. themselves into their week and do you do that Serena because I just think it is yeah. so important. I've done more of it more in more recent years to be honest like when I mean my two are five and seven now 
But I, there was a time when they were really little and I had a two-year gap with them that all I was doing was baby stuff and work, baby stuff and work, and it actually was driving me a little bit insane. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But now I do. I have my, like, my, I re, you know, reading time just for enjoyment, um, my exercise time, yoga, whatever, just meeting my friends, like, and not talking about baby stuff, just... Yeah. yeah definitely and it is really important to put this time in it is not a selfish thing to do because if you are re-energized if your battery is full you're going to have so much more energy for your children and for your work so I, I thoroughly believe it's the most important thing that you can do so let's just go back to my list so you need to plan how you're going to stretch your week so download the thrive week planner there's some instructions about how you do that um, plan time in life for well-being for you and I think just remembering that you cannot do it all OK, as a mum, there are sacrifices you you will have to make and you need to choose actually what are your main priorities going to be. One of my favourite books is a book called Essentialism and I bang on about this all the time. It's about focusing on fewer things, but better. And I think in life, we need to focus on a few things, do them well and stop racing around everywhere. My, my main memory of being a mum with very small children was just the busyness and the hurry everywhere. And one way to uh, eliminate the hurry is to leave a buffer zone. So leave yourself enough time between your surgery and picking the children up. Leave yourself enough time to get places. Don't always be in a rush in a hurry because it's very, very stressful. And we can do that by leaving just an extra five or 10 minutes mm. of a buffer. Leave and just having minutes. breakfast. Like you know, the buffer time should be also about looking after yourself. So, you know, th there were so many times in the beginning where I'd be up feeding the kids, getting them ready, you know, dropping them and getting ready for work and going to work and I'd and get to 11 and all I would have had was like a tea or a coffee to get me through. So I think looking after yourself, like prioritizing what you want and then fitting everything around that, like some, a lot of surgeries, like if you ask them so all my locum sessions I've only ever locumed I've never had a salary job but they've all been at local practices where I work regularly for them and I was initially I just said to them look I you know would you mind if I work nine till twelve because then my parents have to go and you know then it's my son's nap time and this that and they were like yeah it's totally fine and I just hadn't asked them I wouldn't have known that and I would have just been running around doing times that just didn't work around the kids. So I think the buffer zone for what you need and what works for you is just as important as what works for the kids yeah. or for work. Absolutely. And and that's interesting, Serena. See, you knew what you needed in terms of timing. So, so often we're just at other people's beck and call. Oh, can you do that session? Can you do that session? Mm. If you've planned out your week and you know what, what days you're going to work the sessions and what days you're going to have time off, then you're able to make a, 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 a rational decision to go, I'm really sorry, I can't do that day. You don't tell them why. You don't tell them because that's when you're going to the hairdresser or meeting your mates mm. for coffee. Because yeah. that is your time that you have in your diary that you really need. And it is as important as work. But you yeah, need definitely. to know what you are going to do and what the structure of your week looks like. So then you are in control, not everybody else. And I think just on the timing. So you might want to, for example, if you're doing a few days as a salary GP, the rest of the week, you might want to do, say, locum sessions. But you might want to do like an evening clinic. You might say, look, I want the day at home. So that's what I used to. I used to do. The evening clinics, I had the day with the kids and by four, I was so ready to get out the door and just leave the house. And um, my husband would be back by five. So I used to do five till 5.30 till 8.30 or whatever it was at, at this clinic. And I used to do Saturdays as well. And then my other, the other, so the GP update roles, for example, are just stints where I go traveling and, you know, go and, and present the courses, etc. So we'd fit those in. And that was great because, you know, you just, you just, you know, you're away for a few days and it's just nice kind of meeting and greeting other people. And the Milo Commander stuff I essentially can do on the go. And, you know, that's very, very flexible. So just know what works for you. Just don't think you have to do a, a generic nine to five. You can do evening sessions. You can do early morning sessions. You can do weekend sessions. Um, you can add in some urgent care if you want, if you, you definitely want to do kind of outside daytime hours but you you know you're in control you can definitely just work things around what suits you better yeah and don't don't be afraid of asking asking for yeah, what I was I was scared but then I then I had to so then I did and then everyone was like yeah cool and I was just like and that took me a day of practicing in the mirror to get that out <laughs> yeah and the worst that can happen is they say no and then you've yeah. got a choice what are you in control of well do I carry on working here or do I go somewhere else it's going to be more flexible for me 
yeah and also are so if you're a mum and you're locuming and you, you like me you're cautious and you just want to locum at a few regular practices ask the other practice managers to introduce you to the other practices yeah. in the area um and just say you know because of the kids i just want something local and da 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 and just um yeah that's a, a you know a great way to do it Brilliant. okay great so rachel i'll let you tweak your slides yeah no that that's that's it for that section um just everyone will give you the link to download the thrive week planner you know i can't tell you how important it is and, and how much your eyes will be open when you see what you are trying to fit in and how that doesn't actually fit into the amount of time you've got and how much you actually yeah. need to rationalize and drop and drop drop stuff yeah and you'll need to put in things like your appraisal and birthdays anniversary sports days like block them off and then you know what you're doing and what you're what you're not doing yeah. Okay, so now what we're going to switch the gear a little bit and Jenny's going to talk you through what you're entitled to financially as a parent, um, things like childcare vouchers and all those things that keep coming up when we're doing BTS talks. And then Rachel and I are going to come back and present the other bits that you've asked questions about and we'll take your questions at the end. But um, this bit's really important because we don't often know about what we're entitled to um, until someone like Jenny tells us. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Serena. Um, one comment I just would say, actually, that um, based on uh, what Serena's just mentioned, in my experience, there's uh, an increasing number of women partners in, in GP practices. So I would hope that um, you'd get going forward a, a lot more understanding um, than, than perhaps has been there previously when, when you're wanting to work more flexibly. OK. So what we're going to cover then in this section is uh, maternity pay and maternity allowance child benefit, tax assisted childcare, and then um, I'll finish off with some final tips for, for self-employed people. So let's start on maternity pay and maternity allowance first of all, and just on the basics of this, if you're a salaried GP on maternity leave, you're, you'll be entitled to statutory maternity pay. Um, any income that you receive on that, you will have to pay tax and national insurance on it. Um, if you're working for the NHS, there are some more generous um, allowances and pay available, which we'll come on to. Anybody that doesn't qualify for statutory maternity pay or the, or the generous NHS um, uh, payments can get maternity allowance. Um, now, that is not taxable, but, um, but it is payable at a lower rate. So statutory maternity pay, um, this is paid for 39 weeks. So people that are eligible for this are people who have worked for at least 26 weeks continuously for one employer. Um, so 39 weeks of pay, first six weeks we get 90% of the average earnings um, and the next 33 weeks we get £151.20. Uh, so that's paid in the same way as your normal wages and you will have tax and national insurance deducted from that. So if you're working for the NHS and you've worked for them continuously for 12 months, that's 12 months prior to 11 weeks prior to your due date, then, then you are entitled to these enhanced payments during your maternity leave. So you do have to um, say that you will be returning to, to NHS employment after your maternity leave, otherwise you won't get these more generous benefits. So first eight weeks are full pay. Um, after that, the next 18 weeks are half pay, plus um, the amount for SMP as well, that, that, other, that extra £151 a week. And then the following 13 weeks will be just statutory maternity pay, which is the £151.20 per week. Following that, you are entitled to take another 13 weeks, but that would be unpaid. So that brings your total uh, maternity leave to uh, 52 weeks in total. So maternity allowance. So anybody that is employed but doesn't qualify for SMP um, would be entitled to uh, maternity allowance. So this will include self-employed people who are making class two national insurance contributions or anybody who's recently stopped working as well. 
So the maximum claim for this is 39 weeks. So it's all it's 39 weeks, all at 151 pounds 20. So the equivalent amount of the of the lower rate of uh, statutory maternity pay. But the difference is this is not taxable, and you don't have to report it on your tax return. I've put a link there to the eligibility criteria. Child benefit. Before I move on to that, I think there are some questions on here. Let me just have a quick look. Um, I hope I'm not missing anybody here. Do most GP practices follow the NHS maternity leave pay or will they have their, I can't just read that little bit. I've lost it. They're going too quick for me. <laughs> Don't worry, Jenny. I've noted all the questions and we can oh, fire them at you at the end. Yeah, I've marked them all as questions, so oh, we can answer all of those right no, at the end. Okay, that's great, Serena. Thanks. I'll just move on then. So child benefit. So we've got past uh, maternity leave. Uh, we've got our child and, and you're now entitled to claim child benefit. So this is for anybody that's responsible for bringing up a child. Um, it's claimable till certainly till 16. But if your child then carries on in approved education, it can go to um, up to 20. So really, we're talking about the end of A levels that this carries on until. So first child, 21 pounds and five per week. And then it drops to 13.95 for any further children. There's no limit on the amount of children you can have. So every time you have another child, you get another £13.95 uh, for them. Yes, don't let that drive your decision, though. <laughs> you never stop. Um, so the payment is every four weeks. Uh, for so for two children in total, you'd be getting £1,789 a year it works out at. If you want to make a claim, um, and I recommend that everybody does make a claim, certainly initially, um, you can go on to gov.uk and the claim form is form CH2. Now, when you first have your children, I'd encourage you to make your claim as soon as possible. You can make that claim as soon as you've registered the birth, uh, but you can only backdate your claim for three months. So if you go beyond that point before you register, then you're going to be losing out. Do bear in mind that um, depending on your income, there is a possibility that child benefit will be clawed back by the taxman. So if your income is more than £60,000, you would have to pay the full amount of your child benefit back to the taxman after the end of the tax year. That's the January after the end of the tax year. If you earn between 50 and 60,000 pounds, then there's a gradual clawback of your income. Um, so between 50, 50 and 60,000 pounds, definitely worth making a claim because you'll be able to keep some of it, but um, worthwhile putting some money to one side, ready to pay the tax man. Um, I'd also say, because I do it myself, it's also worth making a claim if you earn over 60,000 pounds as well. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You can keep the money in a separate bank account and pay it back when it's due. I'm a bit of a sad accountant, so I put it in a savings account and earn myself a bit of interest. <laughs> but um, not much interest these days, I have to say. Um, the other thing about child benefit is if um, if you decide to take a career break at some point in your in your in your life, if you're if you've made an initial claim for child benefit, that can give you a tick in the box for your state pension entitlement. So so it, so it's certainly worth doing that just for in case. So to get your state pension these days, which is um, flat rate of about one hundred and sixty pounds a week for everybody, you you have to have thirty years of tick ticks in the box for um, national insurance contributions. Obviously, when you're not working, if you're staying at home looking after your children, then you're not paying those national in insurance contributions. But the fact that you've made a claim for child benefit will give you that tick in the box for every year that you're not working up until your child is 12 years old. So, Tax assisted childcare, once you're ready to um, go out and do some work and perhaps put your child into childcare, um, 
there is um, some help available. Now, I've called it tax assisted childcare. The revenue actually call it tax free childcare. But if you pay tax at 40%, like most GPs do, then it's not tax free. It's just a contribution towards your tax. Now, when I had my children, I was in the child care voucher scheme, which was a better scheme, I have to say. But that actually closed for, for new applicants from 2018. If you're in the child care voucher scheme now, you can continue. Um, and for most people, it will be the best option. So we've now got the tax free child care scheme, as it's called. And what happens there is you go on to gov.uk. It's all about gov.uk, the, 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 the finance side of child care. So on gov.uk, you can um, open a, a child care account. And what happens is you put some money into that account that you then use to pay your childcare provider, but the government tops up 20 pence uh, for every 80 pence that you put in there. So you can use that to pay for your childcare up to 2000 pounds per annum, and um, that covers your children's childcare up to the age of 11. Um, your childcare provider, provider that you use has to be approved an approved registered uh, childcare provider and of course signed up to this scheme. Both parents do have to be working to make um, to make use of, the, of this scheme but, but if you're a, a single parent obviously that's okay um, and each parent must also earn a minimum of 100 minimum of 120 pounds per week. The only issue with this scheme is if, if either one of you earn over £100,000, then you won't be eligible for this at all. So when thinking about that £100,000, we're talking your gross earnings before tax, but you do then get an allowance for any pension contributions or gift aid contributions as well. So if you're edging near the £100,000, it may well be worth putting some a bit extra into, into a pension um, just to, to bring you down below that level. Um, so further details there, I've put the link um, to gov.uk once again. So finally, just a few, a few extra tips for self-employed uh, people. So for GP partners in particular, if you're going on maternity leave, the important thing to do is check the terms of your partnership agreement. So certainly most, most um, GP partners will take at least six months maternity pay and the practice will get some income from the NHS to cover the cost of locums while you're off. So the payments are made for about 26 weeks, I think, I think the first couple of weeks. Um, there's about £1,100 a month that comes into the practice for that. And then for the next 24, it's about £1,700 a month. So, so there is help available if you're a GP partner as well. Um, final point on payments, income tax payments on account. So if you're self-employed and you're making payments on account of your tax, then bear in mind when you go off on maternity leave that your income is going to drop. So it is possible to reduce the payments that you're making on account of your tax bill. Um, you need to be a little bit careful with this because if you reduce it too far, the interest will, the, the revenue will charge you interest on the difference. So you probably need a little bit of guidance from your accountant with that. Bear in mind that once you go back to work, if you have been earning at a lower level, you're likely to get a bit of a hit on tax. So if you've made um, low payments on account previously because your earnings have been low, then as soon as your income increases, you'll have a big balance of tax to pay um, and then possibly higher payments on account as well. So. Um, that's probably a little bit too much to take in for some of our trainees, I think. But I think the message is speak to your accountant, get some tax estimates. They can guide you to make sure you don't overpay your tax at a time when you're not working and, um, and you really need the money. So that's it from me. Um, I can see we've had lots of questions coming up, but um, I'll let you go through them, Serena. Or are we going to leave them till the end? Um, my screen keeps freezing. I don't know. 
It's all right, we can see you. We can see you. So yes, Jenny, I think we're going to do the questions at the end. No, you're okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, loads, loads of questions. Loads of questions, and thank you, for everyone. We've we've posted a face a new. We've just created a brand new Facebook group. We've got sixteen members already. It's brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so, if you want to join? Do join. It will help us all keep in touch, and you can you know we'll, we can make sure all the resources are available there as well. And um, yeah, there we are. So, Serena, right. tips for returning from parental yeah. leave. So, I act am I still frozen? No, we can see you. Oh, am I? Okay, so. I actually wrote a blog on this for Pulse and for the MLM blog. So I'm going to share the blog in the follow-up email. But I just wanted to share with you some hopefully really useful tips about the actual transition from being on maternity leave to going back to work. So the first thing I'd say is plan um, your childcare early. Don't assume that the nurseries will be free, particularly with COVID now. Um, just understand what, whether you're going to have a nanny. Are you going to do a nanny share? Are you going to have grandparents in? what you once you've planned your week you're going to know what hours you're going to need and just get you know check out the nurseries or what check out the nannies first and make sure a few months before you're planning to go back you are sorted with regards to your childcare. and the second thing i want to say is contingency so what will you do if you're at work and you're called um that your child's unwell and you need to come and pick them up so I'll give you an example, real life example, what happened to me a few years ago. I was presenting at a VTS up north. It was about three hours by train. I had a call from my daughter's school or, uh, yeah, her preschool at the time to say, oh, um, just as, as I was about to go on and start presenting, they said, oh, um, you, your daughter's been vomiting and she's, you know, crying for you. Can you come and pick her up? So I was three hours away and obviously I now knew my daughter was upset and she wasn't well. So I just got off the phone and I started crying <laughs> because I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, my God, I'm here. Yeah. My poor daughter's there. Like, and then Serena, we've all been there. Yeah. So, well, it was in front of a whole group of ST3s and the program director, and he had no idea. And it was kind of like that. Oh, I just, uh, And then he was just like tapping me on the shoulder like, uh, it's OK, Dr. Chibba. Um, and then these ST3s came up who were all mums or like parents. They were like, oh, don't worry. I was a state last week. And I was so then I kind of got myself together and I called my dad and he went and picked her up. And then and they were really sweet because I, I then presented and then I, my dad called like about 20 minutes in to say, oh, you know, she's been collected. She wants a chat. So I kind of was like, hold on, guys. And I spoke to my daughter. I felt a lot better. But I just realized the importance of having some kind of contingency in place, especially when you're far away, because just bursting into tears isn't helpful. <laughs> I had I had a very similar. I was, I was presenting for Red Whale Lead Managed Thrive course at the Barbican in London. So we had, you know. 150 people there and my fit my fitbit buzzed with a phone call and i saw the number come up i was mid mid presentation it just shows you should not wear your fitbit when you're presenting and it, it was the school's net it was a school's number that had came up and um i, I thought oh no it's, it was 10 minutes so i finished and there was lunch time so i phoned the school said what's what's the problem they said well i'm afraid your your son he's got blood gushing down his leg he's cut his leg and he'd it cut himself yesterday or the day yeah. before and what happened the scar had come off and so he's, they said it's it's bleeding really profusely I think you might need to take him to A&E and I said well um is it bleeding now and they said well uh, no they said we've got a bandage on it and he's got his trousers over the top I said well I tell you what because I know my my son's pretty robust I said if it starts coming through his trousers <laughs> <laughs> Give me another call back, but you know, they'd stop the bleeding. So I do, I do think sometimes it is okay to, yeah. to question and say, "Am I yeah. really needed? Is this a real emergency, or or can or can you cope?" It, it's you know, and actually, my son's leg was absolutely fine. I would have, I would have dropped everything and gone. By the way, before you think I'm yeah. a dreadful mother, I would have dropped everything no, and no, gone. Not if well, just so you know, then on the train back, I was like, oh, my poor baby. Oh, she's going to be so happy to see me when I get home. I got home and obviously grandparents being grandparents, she'd been fed on so many sweets that she's not normally allowed. She was like, oh, why are you back so early, mummy? <laughs> yeah, like, back, literally, <laughs> you cannot win. But yeah, so that, no. you know, so don't be no. like me. Just plan some kind of contingency. And the other thing about planning is, I, I say, be realistic about the number of sessions that you want to work, not what you think you should work, not what you think the practice wants you to work. And I've seen the question about, 
the a person negotiating about returning from maternity leave. And we're going to definitely cover that in detail in the Q&A, which is coming up shortly. But just know what works for you and what works for your family, okay? Because everything else will slot in. And if you're happy with the decision you've made, you'll be better at work, you'll be a better parent, and you'll be better, better to yourself. So just be realistic about the number of sessions you want to. You can always start off with fewer sessions, so like four sessions, for example, do some other bits along the side, and then build up as you get more confident. But you definitely don't need to go in for like eight to 10 sessions and then think, oh, I'll cut back when I get burnt out. The mm. other thing I'd say is, Definitely plan your leave. So even though as a locum, I have a lot of flexibility over what I do and when I work, um, I was at a stage before I'd actually set up my locum manager, I was at a stage where I'd just be working all the time or I'd work different days and be a one surgery, one place and another. But actually setting up the site helped me plan my week and plan my month. And I block off the days that I'm on leave or it's the sports days or it's, you know, play dates or whatever else. And I then have my schedule completely open in front of me on the days that I, I wish to work and the hours I wish to work. So book off all those important times, anniversaries, time for you, like, you know, time with your friends or whatever. Um, so you've got things to look forward to. And also when you're planning your return to work. So it's really important you don't coincide it when you're switching, say, from to, to bottle feeds or weaning or winter times often tricky because there's lots of bugs around in nurseries and bugs around generally. So children at that time tend to be getting unwell a lot of the time, which can really upset your return to work. So just think about how you want to stagger it, but try and make sure it doesn't coincide with those key events to give yourself a, a kind of nice way of phasing that return. Um, adding your accrued annual leave, if you're going into a salaried post, you can add the annual leave that you've kind of saved up on your maternity leave for a phased return of work. So you can say, well, I'm supposed to go back for three days, but I'll take my annual leave day every day for the next however many months. So I'm actually going to go back for two days. And then when I use my annual leave, then I'll, I'll do it that way. So you can do that. As a locum, what I did was I um, essentially had a lot of flexibility in the time I would work and couldn't work or didn't want to work. Um, so I didn't really have an issue with regards to um, using up my leave or, or, you know, kind of not having that flexibility. Um, IT setup's really important. So I, before I went back, I uh, made sure I went in the week before and got all my passwords set up, got the practice manager to do a tour of all the new systems that they were using. And now with COVID, if you've been out of action for a while, there's so many different ways that you'll be processing the consultations, delivering the consultations, recording the consultations. So just go in a week or two early and get all your IT set up, get familiarized with everything again, just so when you go back, it's um, really kind of seamless. The other thing I'd say is I asked for extra catch up slots when I went back. So my clinics weren't 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then a 10 minute break. I just had a few extra catch up slots put in which um, I, as a locum I didn't charge for. So if I was supposed to work nine till 12, uh, my session was actually nine till 12.30 because I had those you know, three extra catch-up slots built in. Um, so for multitasking, that's all about like, you, you, you know, you're gonna have to go back to work. You're gonna have not just your clinical stuff and your portfolio career, but your appraisal, CPD, all, all that kind of stuff that's part and parcel of working. So as a locum or your tax and invoices and stuff. So having something like, my local manager will take a lot of that away from you but for your appraisal and cpd like i just do a lot of stuff on the go so i'll listen to a lot of webinars audio books and they're not necessarily about medicine but i always find a way of reflecting something about that i've learned onto my e-portfolio um the last thing support we're going to talk a bit about support but it's so useful and actually by signing up to this Facebook group that we've just created might be a useful way of mm. building in that support. But I think support's really important, not just from other parents, but non-parents as well, because it's so nice not to talk about your kids sometimes. But just having on a WhatsApp someone you can say, look, could you pick up so-and-so? I'm a bit stuck today. Or, you know, shall we do like a wine and CPD event tonight and just chill out and, and you know, just have some kind of support that can guide you forward. Do you want to add anything to this, um, Rachel? No, I just think the support thing is really important. It's not big yeah. and it's not clever to do it all, to, to cope with it all on your own. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So next bit, 
thriving at work and life and then we'll get then we'll get to some questions so this bit really we just wanted to finish on to say that you know we we don't live to work we work to live and um I know that there's a school of thought that says it's all about what you do out of work and you just you know you work to live but there's a school of thought that says actually we're at work so much that we do need to be happy at work. We do need to thrive at work. So we shouldn't view our job. And I'm hoping that most of you love your jobs, right? But there may be some people that are just finding jobs a bit of a drudgery and, and finding things quite stressful and, and actually starting to dread to go to work. And, and if that's you, then just be careful and just check that you're not heading down into that, that burnout zone. But the good news is there are things that you can do to make work, your working life better. And you don't have to put up with being in a job that you really really hate often just changing your environment changing where you're working will make a really really big difference so just a few a few tips for you on how to thrive in work and life and there's an entire course on this and this is sort of this is what I do this is my the lifeblood of my work but I'm really passionate about this but firstly you need friends at work okay a lot of people say oh I, I don't need friends at work I just you know as long as I've got my friends outside of work but you know what there's some sort of statistic that says if you have a good friend at work it adds seven years to your life expectancy seven years and that that for me is 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 really interesting and I think particularly as a GP, we really need people that we can discuss things and we can offload to and we can just chat away with. Now, if you're a locum or um, you're working several different surgeries or you're working in a small surgery where you're not getting to see people, you might need to create that community of connections. So you might need to find some peers that you can get in touch with, um, you know, maybe go to the go for a, a drink or a coffee with, you know, once a month where you can chat about work. So you really do need to be able to connect. But also don't forget about all those other people that you work with, with the nurses and the receptionists and the practice manager, you know, connecting and making good relationships is is so, so important. And I think, um, you know, join the Facebook group. That's another good way to to connect with people, because I think the more we can support each other, the more be the better. Yeah. Um, get a decompression zone. Um, I'll ask you Serena in a minute. Do you have a decompression zone? Do you know what I mean by decompression zone? Yeah, it's called chocolate. <laughs> chocolate engine. But from, I, I heard about this recently on a TED talk. It, it, and they talked about a third space between work, at, work and home. And I think particularly when you are a, a mum or a parent, you go straight from work to pick up your kids to home. And there is no time where you can decompress between work mode and home mode. And I still find this, if I go straight from a presentation, straight from a coaching session to school to pick up, it just, my head is still somewhere completely different. Now, yeah. a lot of people get this decompression zone during their commutes or, you know, on the way to, from work, or they get to go home or they go to the gym on the way home or they get home, they take the dog for a walk. But actually when you have small children, often that, that bit of time completely disappears so is there some sort of ritual that you can do between work and home or work and picking up the kids that just help you <sighs> decompress reflect on what's just happened during the day maybe reset a little bit and recover and then start off into a ho home mode so it'll be different for everybody it might just be putting on some music in the car in that two minutes that you've got between putting up the kids picking up the kids or it might be sort of going into your bedroom and getting changed and doing a two minute mindfulness meditation I, I have no idea but it's really quite an important thing and I can send you the link to the TED talk that talks all about it that, that's really important um Serena, get the help you need. We just talked about that in mm. sport. You know, I, I was joking earlier, but before the webinar, we were just chatting about cooking and cleaning and stuff. And I was saying, you know, if there's something you're regularly having to do that you could pay somebody else to do that you don't enjoy doing, then then do that if at all possible. Don't feel bad about having a cleaner. Don't feel bad about getting a a food delivery box or something that just means you can pull it out and cook it in 20 minutes or those lovely frozen ready meals from cook or something you know don't worry about that get the help you need to stay sane and to survive and get the childcare you need and get enough childcare. um do not be the default parent um we <laughs> we were talking about this earlier weren't we serena <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we were saying how i don't want my husband here because he's the default parent and i don't want him to come to me and be like serena we should be sharing 50% of this. And I'll be like, uh, thanks, yeah. Rachel. I think I I was listening to a podcast recently. And the, the guy was saying that, you know, particularly women, we, we, we have been brought up to think that we can have it all at work and we can have it all at home as well. But actually, 
we can't we can't do everything and I, I'm you know there are some people that are parenting on their own and hats off to you you know you're doing a brilliant job and you know well done hang on in there get the help that you need please and pay for the help that you need those of you who are co-parenting make sure it is co-parenting that you are not the one doing all the work that your partner doesn't think that they're babysitting when they're looking after your your child but they are looking after their child make sure that they are taking their turn in doing the cooking the cleaning the washing up the childcare because it is so easy to, for us to slip into those sort of traditional home roles and uh, and forget that actually we're working just as hard so just just make sure that you're not being the default parent because of the g word because of guilt and train your children to go to your partner just as much as they go to you when they when they when they need something i know someone whose um child literally will walk past their partner putting their socks on in the bed into the shower while they're having a shower to ask them to take the, the lid off of a, a tub of jam for them <laughs> you know why didn't they ask the person sitting on the bed but they're so used to just defaulting everyone there so make sure that you're not the default parent now how to thrive and work in life i'm a big fan of doing what you love because there you know life is too short for us to spend 25, 30, 40 years working in a job that we don't enjoy. Now, of course, there are bits of our job that we are not going to be that that fond of. There are certainly bits of general practice I could gladly never, ever do again. But there will be someone that, that likes that. So I think, you know, knowing what it is that makes you tick, knowing get a job and ask to diversify in the practice and take take hold of the teaching if you're really good at quality improvement and stuff like that then then you take on that role but diversify within your job to play to your strengths and do what you love and do and do what you're good at and then you know i'm a really big fan of diversifying i i personally could not have just seen patients all week i needed to do some other stuff that use slightly different more slightly more creative bit of my brain and we're so so lucky in general practice that there is so much out there that we can do as well as seeing patients so we can become clinical leads places you can do macmillan stuff like serena does you can go and present on um uh, gp update courses you can do education you can run well-being clinics you can learn how to coach you can do all sorts of of amazing things um are we having problems with the with the it can you just uh just say yes if you can still see and hear us if you would in the chat so i just know that we're still coming through yeah i can see you rachel okay, i'm just good. having a slight issue with my video okay so it's serena that's com coming and going yeah um, sorry but if we diversify not only to get to use different bits of our brain but we also have different different people in our team so you might be working with a different group of people and it will just keep up your interest because for me um just doing exactly the same thing for the next 40 years is is quite depressing but if you can diversify your career and do other stuff within your general practice job you'll be much more engaged you'll be a probably a better gp you'll keep up the interest and you can always just develop your career um, so Serena, I mean, you've done a lot of diversification. What do you think of this yeah. sort of concept? I mean, I agree. I would say for those of you whose screen's frozen, I'm sorry, I think that was me because I was trying to find a link to the retainer scheme. So I went into another window, but if you press, I think it's a, called refresh on your screens, it will kind of restart it. So hopefully that will work for you. But I completely agree with you, Rachel. I think the biggest drawback I had when I was finishing was I didn't know how I would create those different roles. And I thought, oh, I've got to wait until I see a job advert, then I'm going to have to apply. But what I learned was actually I had to be proactive. So I spent a good few months kind of leading up to CCT and after emailing CCGs, um, kind of emailing other doctors that were doing different things to find out how they got involved with it, um, keeping my eye out on um, Pulse, the BMJ, um, and just putting the word out amongst other GPs that have been working for a few years that I was looking to do something different. And then mm -hmm. things did really come. And I think the other thing you probably need to be aware about is people will ask you to do stuff like non-clinical stuff. It's up to you to say, how is this new remunerated? I, how are you going to get paid and how much are you going to get paid? Because I was also very scared about asking about that. And then I remember having a chat with my husband. He was like, well, why don't you just say like oh how is it remunerated and I was like uh, okay that feels a bit less awkward than saying are you going to pay me and and then always the answer was oh yeah yes of course you just send your invoice here and it's, it's this much and so I think um in order to create that just follow what your interests are and use guides like um 
kind of um, coaching, mentoring. There's lots of different schemes out there. There's the Next Generation GP scheme, lots of different things out there to help you kind of connect with something that you enjoy. It will take a bit of work from you to do it, though, um, to start finding those things and developing those things. But there's no shortage of those kinds of role in general practice at all. Yeah, don't don't wait for them to be advertised. But also don't expect everything straight away. So my yeah. friend John, he got involved with the CCG. Uh, he was quite interested in, I think, respiratory. So he started writing a few pathways from the CCG, asked him to write a pathway because he wrote a really good pathway. He then sat on the respiratory committee because he sat on the respiratory committee. He then ended up being the respiratory lead. And then he, um, they said, well, can you come the exec committee? And he ended up sort of, being clinical lead for the CCG it, it was a pathway it wasn't just like they advertised for that job and he he jumped into it likewise if you want to have a teaching career then volunteer to take the students at your own practice and maybe find out who's in charge of teaching at the local university drop them an email and said I'm interested in opportunities can I have a coffee and then next time they ask for someone to come and co-host a webinar volunteer to do that or a seminar volunteer to do it and then gradually you'll you'll start to practice doing teaching um, you then might become the teaching lead for your practice you might then they might you might find out about a job that's advertised you might end up doing a master's in medical education and then you might end up running a medical school I mean you never know but things are rarely fully formed when you get to them often it's you dip your toe and you try something you do a bit of work in your practice first you sort of have to almost prove yourself a little bit in what you're doing but it's it's very rare that these alternative roles are, are, are advertised and they're offered to you on the plate so being proactive is the yeah. the most um important and thing and on, I, um, on the gp education thing what i'd say is so i actually as an st i was coming into my st2 year and i just emailed my local medical school so at the time it was imperial because i was on the st mary scheme and i just said i'm just really interested in doing some teaching for medical students and they said oh great you know and then they paid for me to do their teaching the trainer course ttt something so I went on that and then they allocated me medical students and I was paid to do teaching for a number of sessions a week. And then I said, oh, I'm really enjoying this. Are there any more opportunities? And I said, well, yeah, do you want to be an examiner for the medical school exams? That was hilarious, by the way, like watching medical students. But it was also so much fun. And then when I finished um, from the Mary scheme, I then got put in contact with King's College London, um, who also have, you know, a medical school, and they did campus based teaching. So I would go to their campus and deliver teaching and do their exam. So and that's all paid work. And you don't have to be a fully qualified GP to do it. So definitely, that was me kind of, you know, emailing them. And I think you guys can all, all definitely do it too. Right? Yeah. Shall we? I think so. I mean, I think it's one thing to say that I think we're, you know, watch this space. We, we can't cover all of this in the webinar, but Serena and I have got a few things up our sleeves, um, yeah. actually some more webinars around how to get, you know, how to diversify your work and get a, a really great flexible career. So um, if, if that would be interesting, interesting to you, just maybe put yes in the chat so we can gauge if there's any interest in us running a bit of a course on how to do that. Let us, let us know. So yeah. just really finishing by saying, you know, we want you guys to work happier rather than work harder. You know, we you only have one life. You will be a better mum if you're happy. You'll be a better um, partner if you're happy. You'll be a better doctor if you're happy in what you're doing. So none of this is selfish. It's really, really important. Any, any thoughts on that, Serena? Yeah, definitely. I think well, the only thing that really held me back in the beginning was not knowing how to do it and just being scared of the unknown because actually just kind of taking up a role for X number of sessions and seeing patients as a conveyor belt was the norm and was safe because it was a just defined pathway. So to go off that pathway and to do something different was very scary. And I'm, I've seen like quite a few familiar names in the chat and I know a lot of you are doing very different things. So by all means, post in the chat, like any resources you want to share and things like that, because kind of as the community like that's here today, it'd be really good to, to kind of get through it. Now we've got loads of questions. So we're going to literally get through hopefully as many as we can. Um, thank you, Jenny. I was just about to say, please come back because there's loads of questions on finances that I have no idea how I'm going to answer. <laughs> okay, so, right, we've got so many questions coming through. They're all shifting down. Right, so first question. So some have been sent privately, so that's okay. I'm not going to read out your name if you sent it privately. Um, but we will um, uh, we, we will answer them anyway. So how can I get involved with teaching medical education post-CCT? 
whether it's medical students, GP training, read well. Okay, so I think we've answered about the medical education is super easy. Just Google your local medical school, email the undergraduate department with your CV, tell them you're interested in paid teaching work, um, you're excited about doing that and you'd like to build up experience, can they tell you the process of it? Yeah. And that you're interested in delivering, you know, supervising medical school exams, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, Redwell, do you want to answer that, Rachel? Yeah, I think I just want to say about the teaching stuff. I mean, I, having been the Assistant Director of Studies at three university departments, you need mm. to be teaching in your own practice first. So if you're looking for a job, look for a job in a training practice. Look, look for a job in a practice that takes medical students. You need to demonstrate that you've been interested in it in the first place. So that that just start, start easy, start there. Red Whale, I think Red Whale um, intermittently advertised for, for presenters. Um, so I think that that's something, you know, you need to maybe just contact them and ask them to put you on the list of, and let them know and let you know when the next um, next thing's coming up. Again, if you want to be a, a, a presenter, practice locally, contact your local VTS and say, can I come back or can I, I'm here, can I do some present presentations for you on a topic of your choice? And then you can get some sleep because you need to get some practice under your belt. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Jenny, one for you. Um, ST3s, will the trust pay for my maternity leave? Do I have to apply separately for SMP or is it automatic? No, it's automatic. So if you're employed, your employer will automatically deal with your, your maternity pay. You don't have to worry about that. And Jenny, another one for you. Is child benefit not income dependent? Can anyone and everyone claim? Okay, very good question. So yes, um, if, you've, if you're responsible for children, you can claim child benefit. The issue is whether you then have to pay some back um, to the revenue part of this high income child benefit charge. So if you, um, if you earn above £50,000, then there's potential for you have to, pay to, to have to pay some back. Once you get above £60,000, you would have to pay it all back. But that doesn't stop you making that claim in the first place. And in fact, it's important to know that often it's the, it's the uh, mum who makes the claim for child benefit. Um, and it might be that the mum is not earning more than £50,000, particularly if she's on maternity leave. But if if the mum's partner earns above fifty or £60,000, then they would have to make payment back to the revenue. So it's not necessarily the same person that receives the child benefit that then has to make the payment back. And that applies even if your partner isn't the uh, child's father. So I do think it's a very unfair system, but, th but that's how it works. Okay. And then another comment, private comment. Thank you for organising. This is so useful. If you've been an ST3, then had a couple of months break before starting a salary job with an APMS practice, are you eligible for NHS maternity pay? Um, yes, because you'd still be, yes, if you're salaried, even if it's an APMS practice, it's still an NHS contract, it would still be an NHS employer. So, um, oh, hang on. And then a couple of months break. Um, yeah. Then salaried. So ST3, yeah. couple of months off, yeah. then salaried job with an APMS well, practice. I mean, it depends when your baby's due. So you have to have, you have to have 12 months continuous NHS employment before your 11th uh, before 11 weeks before your due date so um so if that if that's not the case because of this break then that is that's a potential problem okay um, the person that messaged that you can contact jenny her details will be up on the screen shortly if you if you want to find out any more about that okay so pfizer saying i'm concerned about the availability of locum work i'm an st3 due to cct in december thinking of part-time salary part-time locum due to the fact that I'm concerned about locum job availability in the COVID climate. Have you noticed this, Serena? What's your advice on this? So I've, yeah, I, I've kind of been involved quite a bit in terms of locum support for the COVID um, kind of pandemic. And um, what I've noticed, so with, so what I'd probably differentiate is if with my local manager, you add your jobs that you've found through practices and other local practices can send you sessions if you're a local GP. 
So because you book directly, you're not competing for those jobs with other people. If you're on an agency setup and you're having to compete for shifts, though that cohort has been, and I've noticed a few names that were on some of the other webinars where we talked about this, where they were basically trapped by the agency's terms and conditions. So they couldn't approach those practices directly anymore because they'd always worked through the agency. And now they're competing with hundreds of or thousands of other GPs for those jobs that come up. So luckily, the My Local Manager GPs, because they've always, and they're a mixture of salary GPs, partners, and full-time locums that use the software, because they have their protected relationships with their practice. So I use My Local Manager and I'm a locum. And what I noticed over the last few months is I've still been working, um, but my sessions went down. But all my practice managers messaged me to say, look, in a few months, the partners are going to be taking their leave and it's going to be, get, be getting busier. So we'll message you. So I know I'm not competing with anybody. And actually now, the last few weeks have been really busy for me. And August, end of August and September are going to be like, I'm filling up now. My diary is filling up. So I think if you're CCTing in December, my advice to, to you would be start contacting. So that's when winter pressures kick in. So I'd probably say from October, start contacting the other training practices on your VTS. Use NHS choices to find your own GP practices. Um, and tell them that you're finishing soon, you, you've trained at this other practice, and you know, you'll know you be finishing soon, you'll be looking for locum work. And, um, and I'm sure there's not going to be a shortage of work kind of come December. Um, but what I would say is if you want to do part-time salaried with a bit of locum, why not? Because at least you'll get a stable income with salaried work, and you can locum as much or as little on top as you want. So I think there's no right or wrong way to do it. And I think it's probably sensible to think about doing maybe a, a salaried role for a few days a week and then topping up with locum work. But I can send you a link to the COVID webinar if you're interested. But I'd say um, I think by December, I think it will settle. But what's important is that you um, that you build your own autonomy with practices if you're going to locum because you're self-employed. So you need to have that that support yourself in terms of um, kind of what you want to do. OK, cool. So oh, some of the questions have disappeared. Um, yeah, right. Experience, Serena, that practices are keen to have salaried GPs rather than locums. So I'm sure that's yeah, good. I think it's a mixture, Jenny, because I think they can't afford to have, say, like the ultimate number of salary GPs because it's a, a permanent cost that you're supplying. But um, so I think locum work's always going to be there. But I definitely think going forward, the, the shift is now going to be for that direct relationship because practice managers now, like I did a survey, um, a massive survey, because we've got over 7,000 practices linked to um, my local manager, all of whom the GPs kind of work for directly. And I did a large survey when COVID first hit and all the practice managers said, look, going forward, we're going to have to, because of like government guidelines, etc., we're going to have to make sure every GP who's working for us, locum or not, is inducted, knows where the PPE is, we know their risks. And they're like, we're not going to do that every week for a new locum. We're going to want the same locum in to cover. And all of them said they've got maternity leaves coming up, they've got partners wanting to take annual leave sabbatical. So they're going to need that flexible workforce. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think at the moment it is everybody like across all sectors have felt the impact of COVID um, professionally. Um, and I think, you know, locum GPs, GPs are part of the casualty, but I think, yeah, definitely protect yourself going forward. Right. Next question for job child benefit is £60,000 limit for joint income. That's no, you, unfortunately. So so it, it's um, it's an individual thing. So if any one of your of you or your partner earn more than 60,000, then then that person will have to pay the child benefit back. OK, and then another one for you, Jenny, from Zoe might be a bit of a niche question for Jenny. I'm on the old childcare voucher scheme. I'm an ST3 moving lead employer, change of area, but remaining ST3. Should I be able to continue on the same voucher scheme as I'm still in NHS employment? Um, yes, it's actually not a, not a, the childcare voucher scheme is not actually relevant to NHS employment. It's it's all just about employment. So if you're still on the scheme, you should be able to continue. Yes, um, okay. I assume you're moving straight from one employment to the other, so that that shouldn't be an issue at all. Okay, and Sarah's asking, can you still use the tax free scheme for one child at nursery whilst on mat leave with another? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. And can you backdate for tax free childcare? I think everyone's thinking, hang on a minute. <laughs> Ten years ago, when I had my no. child. 
<laughs> no, you can't because for tax-free childcare, you have a childcare account and you pay for your childcare out of that account based on the money that you've put in. So no, it's it's impossible really to backdate, unfortunately. And for child benefits, can you get this if you're already getting the tax-assisted childcare? Yes, completely separate. Yes, so you, you're enti entitled to claim both, yeah. And as is asking, does staff bank work alone count as continuous NHS service? Staff bank. Well, um, you'll probably know more about this than me, Serena. So if you're doing staff bank work, are you not employed? Is that self-employed work or so is technically it? Technically, you're self-employed. So if you've had, so you're, you're self-employed, so essentially you're locuming. So I think you'd probably have to check because continuous NHS service like where you salary GP then you did locum and then from locum you did staff bank work in which case possibly it is continuous NHS service but if you've had gap so salary then time off then locum then a bit of time off then bank work that might not be so I think it depends on um, in what context that staff bank work has happened. So what was the what, what was the actual question on there? I'm just does, the question was does staff bank work alone count as continuous NHS service? But it doesn't say what what. Right. So this is for the maternity leave then, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. sure about that, Azza. We'll have to we'll have to look into that. Right. One for you, Rachel, and I guess one for me from Monica. How do you negotiate with your practice after returning from mat leave? Say you want to pick up the children from nursery. Is it normal practice to negotiate? Oh, God, loads more questions coming in, so it's skipping. Negotiate working one and a half sessions on one day and one and a half sessions on the following day. So what's the question? How do you negotiate with them? Yeah. <clears throat> So um, oh, we teach about this on the Lead Manage Thrive course about negotiations. So that the worst thing you can do is go, here's my position. This is what I want and I'm not going to be flexible and take it or leave it. Otherwise, I'm walking out of here. The best thing to do is to state what's your preference and find out what they need as well. So this is what I need. This is why I need it. What, what are their needs? What are their interests? What, what do they need? And then you can see if you can come to a position where actually a win-win solution and it may be that actually they ask you they say well we can't do that on that day but if you'd be willing to come in on that day to do a session instead then we can we can make it work so I think if you're negotiating if you're too militant and stick to your position then it's very difficult for for people to you know if they can if they can make it happen brilliant but but often practices don't have that much flexibility but I would say you are also in a bit of a, a buyer's market in terms of you know they're not being or not being enough GPs out there so you can actually choose to a large extent where you work these days so I I think that the biggest problem people make in negotiation is firstly not knowing what they want and secondly not knowing when they're going to walk away so not knowing what their sort of bottom bottom line is and then they can flex around that what, what would you say Serena? So I would say because this ties in with Amanda's question about she's going back into two months and her daughter's never tasted formula and she doesn't know if she's going to be able to keep pumping at work so she's stressed about thinking how she's going to fit mm. that in so what I'd say is my learning point was um, if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. And if you ask nicely, you'll get. So I went back. So just as a don't want to give too much information. But when I went back, I was still <laughs> like breastfeeding my son. And I had this three hour window where I could work and I have to get back for feeds and stuff. And I just said to the practice manager, I said, look, you know, I'd love to come back and, you know, help you guys out with sessions and stuff. But I can I'm restricted with times at the moment. So I can do these times. Um, would that be OK for a few months? And then obviously, as I get, you know, more flexibility, I can definitely come back and do more. And and then I also said, if you need help with other things like your paperwork, documents, bloods, I can do those at home. I can get set up at home so I can help you with that. And it was a winner. And they were like, yep, yeah, cool. So I actually did that for many months. So what I'd say to Amanda and for anyone else who's worrying about flexibility, like just ask and tell them why it's not like you're saying look I just sorry I just don't get out, out of bed on uh, Monday morning so I'm just gonna have to do off you know if you're like look I'm just I want to get the baby settled into nursery and I, I need to pick up and drop off for a few months like would it be okay so I do two mornings and I also maybe do some extra paperwork or whatever you know kind of not obviously it's not unpaid if you're locoming you'll be paid for that but and if you're salaried you can work in your admin time and maybe do some of that from home so just just negotiate that and I think now because so many sessions have been delivered by phone and video 
that shouldn't be too difficult to be able to work around your child care needs because it isn't forever. It's, you know, it's for a short amount of time while you find your feet. And I think there's no harm in no harm in asking at all. And I think as long as it's reasonable, um, why not? Yeah, the, the, there's a sort of follow up question on that as well, saying, yeah. um, is it normal for practice to split sessions across days? Well, I think, you know, I think the, the days of really traditional general practice are, are probably over. And I would say that, you know, the great thing is that mm. GP surgeries have got the freedom to choose how and when they employ their GPs. So what's to say they can't split a a GP session and be flexible about about that um, and I know that certainly um, there are some organizations that offer sort of shifts and offer you a two-hour shift as opposed to a four-hour shift so just like Serena said if you don't ask you yeah. won't get but if you if you come up with a really creative solution that's going to work for them suggest it and, and see what yeah. they say yeah okay so some people are saying how do I connect with practices can I post the NHS choices I will last time I tried to do that I froze everybody's screen so I will we'll send out the email end. afterwards shall we yeah I'll send out a link for NHS you can just google find GP NHS choices and it comes up and you put your postcode in it comes up with a list of practices you will then call those practice managers and you'll say look I'm looking for work here's my can I send you my CV etc I'm a local GP and then they will contact you um you know, they'll contact you. Okay, so someone's saying, how do I find out which practices give the golden handshake? <laughs> Jenny, who's giving the golden handshake and how can we know? Well, it's not, it's not the practices that give the golden handshake. It's the, um, it's the NHS. So if you join, a part, join as a partner with any GP practice, you'll be entitled to, uh, to make a claim for that. Um, or I think it may be the practice that makes makes a claim. So that's twenty thousand pounds coming in for any new partner. You have to stay as a partner in that practice for five years, otherwise the amount has to be paid back. Um, but, um, but but quite a good sweetener, I think, for new partners. Yeah, yeah definitely. And there's questions about so the retainer scheme link. Um, you're going to get an email with all the links um, linked to the retainer scheme. So you can do four sessions on there as part of the retainer schemes. Then you get your CPD. You can't do, you can do locum work in the sense that you can do extended access and urgent care and you can do non-portfolio roles as part of that scheme. But I don't think you can do, you can't do traditional locum work on that scheme. Um, good number of sessions. Rachel, what's a good number of sessions a week in a salaried post as a mum? Oh, gosh. I've never done a salaried post, so I can't really comment. It depends what you want to do. I did, I did, when I first started working without children, I did six sessions in a salary post and two sessions as a um, in, in education and I had a day off and that was brilliant. When I had my kids, I went down to six sessions overall. So I did four as a GP and two in my education post and then actually gradually increased the education and decreased the GP. I personally didn't work, want to work more than three days a week with very small children. That is a completely personal preference. But that, for me, was a good balance. What What did you, when yours were really little, how much did you work, Serena? So I did about four to five sessions seeing patients. And then I did, um, so my local manager was pretty much all week because it's always been very busy. But it's something I really enjoy, so I can't really class it as work. Um, it is work. It is a proper job. But I just love it so much. It doesn't really feel like it. And then all the other stuff, like the Mac GP stuff, the teaching and stuff, I was um, the Macmillan GP is like a couple of sessions a week and I only started that uh, a year and a half ago mm -hmm. actually um, and the other stuff was really flexible the medical student teaching I just did whenever I wanted to I just dipped in and out so I've just kept it really flexible actually. I, th I think it is worth saying that not all sessions are equal as in yeah teaching session takes up a lot less energy than a full-on clinical session I I think mm. that you yeah. know doing a full day of clinical work it is really is really tiring and it wouldn't leave you with much energy to do anything in the evening whereas a, for me a full day of the teaching work where you're not in front of yeah. people all the time you're often just developing sessions is yeah. not as energy draining so I do think you need to match it to your energy and you may find that you can do more sessions if you're balancing up doing other stuff and it's not just patient facing than if you but some some people are fine seeing doing 10 sessions of surgeries a week I'm not one of those people <laughs> I don't know, yeah. you know because it is tiring okay Jenny one for you I'm an ST3 in August CCTing in October 
hoping to go into salaried job. Will I be eligible for maternity pay if I became pregnant and then was in NHS employment, including a year of mat leave? So I think the question is, if you've been on maternity leave, you return back from maternity leave pregnant and then you go on maternity leave again, is that still, are you still eligible for maternity pay? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. As long as you've got that um, 12 months continuous NHS employment, yes, that's fine. Can yeah. I just mention about the childcare vouchers? I think I've actually misled, misled somebody on one of the previous questions. So with yeah. childcare vouchers, although you can continue with them, if you change employer, you can't continue. Um, so that will automatically end and you would end up having to go onto the um, tax free childcare system, which of course is not as um, as beneficial. So yeah. just to make that clear. Okay. Amanda saying, I'd really like to have my children close together. I'm considering locoming. With saving for maternity leave, is it unrealistic to save enough over 12 months compared to being a salaried GP with NHS maternity pay? Is the difference in pay that significant? No, not really. It's not. I just locumed a bit more before I took maternity leave and then I did my keep in touch days when my second, when my son was uh, about seven months and I did 10 keep in touch days over, I don't know, seven, eight weeks. And um, and then I kind of was back and forth according to when feeds and things would allow me. So I don't think you necessarily lose out. Um, just think it's just what's right for you. Might, you know, just look at what's right for you, if that flexibility is right for you, if you want a salary job. Right, okay, so we're gonna wrap up. There's still questions coming in, but um, I did say this to the girls, because they were like, how long is the webinar gonna be soon? I'm like, we always aim to finish an hour, but I was like, but the questions always go nuts. So I don't think we're gonna to get to bed till 10, but we're gonna share these really useful resources with you in the follow-up webinar. A friend of mine, she's a program director, um, Sunny, and she set up with a group of program directors this doctor's mess thing, so you can email them for support. And we're going to send you lots of tips as well as the stuff you messaged about. I'm going to find stuff about the retainer scheme and everything else to pop it in. And if you'd like us to do more stuff like this, like on Milo Commander, we do things like this every month. But if you'd like us to do a course, I think, Rachel, you said, would you like, a, you know, you might want to do put together a course with us. We're happy to. Yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can definitely, we've got some really good ideas about what, what people want, want to know about. And I, I've had a course brewing anyway for a long time about how to diversify your career as a GP, so career development GP. So um, yeah, just uh, keep an eye keep an eye out on your emails for that and, and let, us, uh, let us know if, if you're interested. Join the Facebook groups because we can start to post anything that we're going to do in that Facebook yeah, group true. as well. And, and yeah. invite your colleagues to the Facebook group. If you know anyone who I think who wants to work flexibly and and diversely in their within their career as well getting them to join this this facebook groups so i think um it would be a really great resource for gps definitely and jenny's numbers on there she's not on tiktok guys so just maybe drop her an email and then, <laughs> and then whatsapp if you need I'm vintage, Serena. remember i'm vintage yeah <laughs> that's true that's true but thank you all so much um thanks for coming i really hope that was useful the CV template and all that stuff you can get on the resources section of MLM and Rachel's posted her shapes toolkit as well. So, um, yeah, I really hope that was useful. I hope you feel more empowered about kind of taking control of your careers and going back and really enjoying work and enjoying being parents. Um, and, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Serena. Thank it's been really you. great to be here. Thank oh, you. yeah, it's a lot of fun, ladies. Thanks for joining me. Good luck. Good luck with <laughs> your careers. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.